この番組はご覧のスポンサーの提供でお送りします。a l r i g h t y welcome everyone.I am Tiabu, I will be your server for today.For today, our chef Rifujin has prepared a very special course. Uh, menu for today is one plate of abject terror with side helping of complete surprise. No substitutions! Thank you for coming and joining us today. Cost will be your soul in exchange for getting to experience episode. Yes? Good. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Tia Boom here for abject terror and complete surprise. It's a turning point. Not a turning point. Not a turning point. Not a turning point. Fuck. It's a turning point. I want to skip all of the discussion here in the beginning and just get into it. I'm actually deeply tempted to do that, but I'm going to say a couple of things. First, we have gotten so high from a high, high spot. The drop down into the pit is a real long way. God, I hope that's not what's coming for us. However, while all of our turning points up to this point have kind of been nukes that have obliterated our progress and sent us careening off in an unexpected direction, a turning point isn't in and of itself bad, right? I might be huffing maximum copium here, but hear me out, hear me out. You could be going in a direction and just turn in a different direction and still be on the same plane. It doesn't always turn down. It doesn't always smack you up inside the face and throw you careening off in a direction because you got borked by God. Speaking of which, we haven't seen a God in a while. Or a man God. Wonder if during a turning point we might get to see a familiar but potentially unfriendly face. I don't know. Trauma is what we're experiencing right now. You and I, or at least I, I can't speak for you, but given the way that people respond to the comments, I think that some of us feel the same way about this shit. Trauma is what we're experiencing. We've had enough points to draw a line, and the line goes turning point bad. <laughs> and now things are so good. Married, settled in. It's felt like slow as we've been in it. Like, man, it's not like bombastic, world changing action is happening. But as soon as this idyllic lifestyle that Rudy has built here at this school, this world of safety, where his biggest concerns are his reputation and his friendships and his romance life, when that gets threatened, suddenly, looking back on it, it becomes more satian filled. More nostalgic, more like a peaceful time that we might not ever get back to. And we might be torn away from it now, in some capacity. We know from the OP and from some of the information going on, and just from the like, storytelling vibes of the thing, Rudy is, is not done adventuring. He's not done going out there into the world, and neither is his family. His family's adventures continue, the adventures of Roxy and Eris continue, and. It's not a story that can succeed and continue if our characters stay stuck here. But it's nice to have a home base, and it would be great to leave it on terms different from our first leavings of important places. Instead of being ripped away by an unforeseen magical cataclysm and sent careening halfway around the world to a hellscape of demons. Maybe going off on an adventure with the blessings of our dearly beloved might be a little bit better. Knowing that there's a group, a society around them that can be relatively safe and protective and, and good, that there's a home base to return to. That would be a very different turn to a turning point, wouldn't it? It'd be quite a relief given the fear. Intention that is currently gripping me as I face down this episode. But there's no way to know, is there? And so, for the second time in just a few days, separated by a weekend, of course, because weekends, I'm going to draw something with arrows. But this one can be far more simplistic or symbolic, I think. I think 
It's more than arrows, too. It's like this. Shit, I fucked up the, the angles. Fuck, shit, fuck. Ah, it's okay. Happy little accidents is what we get here, folks. Happy little accidents. Sometimes what we need is gestury instead of framed out solid. If that's the vibe my hands want to go for, that's the vibe I'll go for. And I'll let it take me away. Dunzo. All the arrows lead out the windows. I feel like that's where we're heading. I feel like it'll be... Like we have to go join Paul. Because we've got that information about it. Or something about having to go... Having to go save Zanisu. Or something like that. I know that I probably shouldn't know that because it's in the OP and stuff. Like, if I were just reading it as is, I probably wouldn't know that information. I'd be more scared of the turning point. But as it stands, I feel... I feel scared because it's a turning point. But I feel less scared because I feel like this one's going to be different. I feel like instead of the world happening to Rudy, Rudy's got some choices to make. That's part of why the there are multiple arrows. When I first thought of doing this, I actually thought it was going to be like one arrow straight forward and then getting diverted off to the side, like single, single right angle. That's why I was like, oh, it's going to be so simple when I do this drawing. It's going to be so simple. It's going to take no time. But then when I started drawing, the first thing that I wanted to draw was the windows, like because we're in that house. Those three windows are there. That's the space that we've established. And then when I started drawing an arrow, it's like, oh, the arrow goes out, but it goes in, in multiple directions. All of them lead out of here. I think that there's no way narratively that we can stay stuck here for much longer unless unless things get really bad like we'd have to stay stuck here and then the world would collapse outside and like force us to be dispersed i think if sylphie's going to stay safe and i think she is if our whole little family dynamic thing is going to stay safe then rudy leaving of his own volition with blessings seems like the move i don't know though i'm so fucking scared I'm just copiuming. I, I realize that I'm just copiuming. I'm like coming up with the best possible options that I don't freak the fuck out right now. And that's pretty useless because we're going to see what we're going to see and what's going to happen is going to happen. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me for Mushoku Tensei season two, episode 18. We're still watching the MTBB versions. Should be fun and good. And we're going to watch this episode and see where we turn to. Thank you so much. Early access on the Patreon for the next one. I've got episode 18 up and ready to go. It's sitting at zero seconds. There'll be two versions, picture in picture in the description. Timer on YouTube. Beep, beep, timer to count you down. Beep, beep, timer to count you down. Fuck, there's nothing to it but to do it. Uh, it's pretty. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, it's less pretty. That's fine. That's fine. We're fine. Everything's gonna be fine, guys. Oh, hi! Do we get a- No! Ah! Yes! Oh! 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 Victory! Holy shit, we're studying together, too! Yes. That would be cool. Which old plan? Whoa, whoa, whoa. That plan. That's new. Dude, writing a book's fucking hard. That's more like it, man. Go use your marketing skillage. Propaganda. Eh. 
Yes, Nor that's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. A task, a task. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I could see her as a little historian or archive archivist. That would be perfect for her. Okay, I'm not that scared now. I'm not that scared now. Everything's fine. <laughs> I'm so scared. <laughs> Fuck, that made me- it made me more scared. It actually made me more scared, no! <laughs> Fucking dragon's gonna come out and obliterate Norn! Like... <laughs> Waiting for that metal drop, just in the episodes, you know? And then insanity. Fully unfollowable. <laughs> Trying to figure out the drum beats. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I suck. Oh, it's blue. It's pretty. Who? This is very good of him to preempt these sorts of things. <laughs> oh, sick, yeah. Yeah, no, give Norna an allowance and or or pay. <laughs> Uh. Oh. Soil and dirt are very different. Tell me this car. Wait, actually, he shouldn't be able to do that. Living soil is so valuable. You can't make you can't make that. Can he make all the microorganisms? He can't do that. There's no way he can do that. We can talk about this, but like soil is alive. <laughs> That's fucking three puppy dog eyes. <laughs> ah, and the third one fails. She learns she can't do everything. A rug? A curtain? <laughs> Smart. This this one is a devil. <laughs> this one is a devil. You're a little monster. After haggling so hard. Meh. She sure does. That is a person you want helping to run your household. A hundred percent. Is it a dress? What is it? Oh, it's a furnishing. Oh. Wait, oh. What? What? Is that covering a window? Or is it just hanging there? I think it's covering a window. Oh, pet the bottle. That's so cute. Oh, shit. And then an organism. And then an organism that meets specific conditions. Fuck. I wonder when we'll hit a wall. I wonder when we hit a wall. Because there's gotta be... My contact?
Come on! I forgot what our reward was. It's dancing lights. Eh. <laughs> Japanese. Oh, Moto Sugoi. I wonder who this. Yeah, I wonder who this authority is. Oh shit, they made it. They made a fucking sick ass dragon. Wait, he made it. Fuck yeah, Sanaba. Let's go. Now you gotta learn to paint. Oh, that doll, though. Hello, Jinja. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Duty Duty I respected Ginger, that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> you traded her for that? I didn't even realize that. Holy crap. God, that piece feels so fragile, Julie. Wait, he figured out a solution? A chastity belt? Oh shit, is it actually? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a straight up chastity belt! Oh, it's so brutal. <laughs> From her or in general? Huh. We need mana batteries and shit. Yeah, that's cool. It's very silly. <laughs> it's very silly. Like, full old-school chastity belt style silly. Oh, we're doing morning runs again! Let's go. We haven't seen Sylphie at all. Have you noticed? Oh, there she is. There it is. <laughs> okay. Literally zero up until that point, though. He's integrated in a community. That's beautiful in the background. Fuck. This is just establishing the baseline. Or it's gonna get fucked. Mayonnaise. Oh, I hate it! What's up on the other side of the hill? Fuck, I'm so scared. The shoe's about to drop. We're here now, right? Hello? We're about to have a converse. She's pregnant. You can't get cold feet if you gotta tell us something. Come on, they've been banging all day, every day. It's what it is, it's what it is, come on. The sit-down combo, come on, baby. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. You got a bun in the oven. I thought elves had a hard time. Turns out we've been having a hard time too. <laughs> that is a turning point. Holy fuck. You're not gonna be able to feel anything, but. That is the amazing response. Fuck. That is a turning point. Holy shit.
Could that just... Could that be it? Maybe an I love you would be good. I'd, I'd love to have baby with you. That sounds great. So happy. Oh, fuck. All the time. Oh, that hit good. Oh, that hit good. Huh. That's a weird, weird choice of words. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I love how so fucking fumbly they are. Yeah, man. Your world just changed dramatically. Oh. Talk about a turning point. Wow, a lot of emphasis on that cut. You... You shut the hell up. No, that is inaccurate. That is wrong. Lies. False. Lies. False, my dear. You can fuck all the time. Ain't no delicate condition about that. Whoa, that's a hell of a leave. Takes a village, it takes a village, it takes a village, it takes a village, it takes a village. We're making progress on that. Of course. God, I'm still so scared. If we make it out of the episode without something else going horribly. First grandkids. Oh, totally. Totally. Fuck. This is so good. Fuck. Oh, now we're dreaming about the future. I don't know. I don't know. Now it's scary. It just got scary again. It just got really scary again. This is fucked. I feel fucked. This is terrible. What the fuck is happening? What's the, what is this? What's now? Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, God. Oh, jeez. Is that sweater or tears? Oh, fuck. Okay. Are we in? <laughs> and here we are. Oh, it's from Geese. He doesn't fucking know. Fuck you, Hitogami. Fuck. But. <sighs> mm, you've got a, a, there's no regrets about bun in the oven. Yeah, tons has gone great. And you wouldn't have had any of those. But now there's this FUD, this, like, missing out. But if I don't go, my- my mom... He's really... the heavy breathing. Fucking shithead. Yeah! Mm. Mm, 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 mm. 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 Fuck. Fuck. 
Fuck. Yeah. So many variables now. Oh. Oh. There's so many variables. Oh. Uh, two years. Two years. You can't bring her with. Fuck. What if you had a teleporter? The conjuration person. You'll miss out on a great opportunity. Yeah, but Zenitsu. What? What? With Lydia and Persena? They want to pack, though. What the fuck? That is a wild thing for Hidogami to, to say. What the fuck? Oh, this is so wild. This is so much weirder than all of our other turning turning points. Unless he said that to fuck you over and, like, make you not do that. Unless you had a teleporter. You gotta talk to her. You gotta talk to her. You gotta communicate, man. You can't bear this on your own. Mm. Mm. Worry, worry, worry. Mm, the same routine, but the the tone is different. But if you don't go, you'll never know. Stuck as fuck. This is balls. It's exactly that. It's the arrows, man. It's like too many options. Yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. Don't tr decide that for him. No. Don't decide. I think he really cares, dude. You are deciding that for him, and that's not a not fair or kind. Damn, Alina Elise. I really don't like that. Maybe not. Sonoba's sick. Sonoba's so rational so often. I mean, he's crazy sometimes, but... So rational sometimes. Damn. All the support in the world, and you can't get them to make a decision for you. Yeah, what do you got, Sonoba? You're a wise man. Hmm. Yeah, but not getting to hold your child. Not being able to hold your child, though? He's gonna go. He has to go. This is the first time it's felt like Rudy is having to make a, a, a man's decision, an adult decision. That's not accurate, but it feels like it. Fuck, 
though. Wow, yeah, aware. The windows, the windows. Yeah. So silent, no, no music. Oh, was she going to go on her own? To hell no. Gotta go help dad and mom. Norn, that's not happening, you ding dong. Oh. Bro, oh, don't say that. <sighs> Somebody's gotta go. Your decision just got made. That's fucked up, Dorn. You have the opportunity. You could. Shit, you're gonna regret it. He don't got me told you! But he knows probably what's gonna- Fuck, I don't know. I'm going. Gotta go save mom, man. It's important. It sucks that this is important, too. Great shot. Shot reverse shot. Hey. Desert Journey. And so we end Turning Point 3. And it is not and is as expected. Amazingly, what I had hoped for, my biggest hope was that Rudy would leave to accomplish something with the blessings of his family and leaving a strong support system behind so that we can continue our adventure and have something calling us home. It changes our dynamic dramatically. We switch from being the Iliad to being the Odyssey. There's something to come home to. It's not just a journey out there for something. There's something to come home to. It changes the tone of everything. And, and it changes, it put, creates a time limit, like a time-bound limit. Because the longer Rudeus is traveling, the less of his child's life he sees. And the less quickly he returns to see it. Wow. So this, what this ends up being is precisely what I had hoped would be the best case scenario in a way that sucks. In a way that sucks. Because of the way it's framed. Because we build up to these lovely moments. Like, first, the finding out that Sylphie is pregnant is lovely. It's, it's fucking lovely. But what it sparks in us is that, se that set of memories of like where we've been and how we've gotten up to here. And then we get whomped by these, these hopes, right? Suddenly the hope, the light at the end of the tunnel is within reach. Rudy can reach out and taste it. He can, he can touch it. That's the thing I've been aiming for this whole time. This idyllic, peaceful, whole family life. It could happen. It's happening right now. But, bam, it evaporates. And because we've gotten to such a high high, it's such a hard fall. But, there is something different. Dramatically different. Dramatically different. And it's so important for us to note it. Where do we fall to? Because we don't fall through to the bottom. We've been at rock bottom before. We've been at nowhere land. We've been at pit bottom. But, Rudy has climbed up out of the pit. And then reached out like a spider web, a network of a safety net, of a family, a found family. Real family too, sisters. Wife. 
Alina Lise, but also found family, Zanaba, Julie, Ginger, Cliff, Linnea and Persena, all these people who matter and who can be there, who can be around, Ariel, although she's leaving. And so when we drop off that high point, there's a threat. It's like, it's enough. It could absolutely unsettle everything. But we hit like the, the, the top opening of the pit, right? And there's the big pit down below with a hard spiked bottom. You know, if we hit that, it's death. It's like bad. It's back to ground zero post Eris breakup zone or like worse. Bad. But instead, we hit this trampoline that we've built, this mesh that covers the top of the pit. And it's resilient enough. It bends, right? A lot of people are freaked out. Aisha and Norn are freaked out. It bends. Alina Lise is going to go on her own, like, bends. Sophie's worried. It bends. But it doesn't break. And it rebounds. And so we come up to baseline. Maybe we don't jump back up to high, idyllic, lovely, glorious beauty. But we come back to baseline. Because of the work that we've done. Because of the experience that we've had and how much more resilient we are after climbing up out of the pit, getting rocked by circumstance doesn't send us down to the bottom again. Our baseline is more resilient. It's more rubbery. It bends in the wind. It's a reed, right? And so instead of cracking and breaking and falling and, and, and avalanching down to the very bottom of hell, despair, torment, trauma, locked up, panic attack, stuck in your room, despair... We bounce down to, like, worried, spooked, not sure what to do, uncertain, sort of spinning your wheels. And yet, he's not in the same place, right? Because where we end up right after this, right after the Hitogami conversation, he gets this, this rocked thing. He consults his daemon, right? In a, in a metaphorical sense, I understand that Hitogami is an actual entity that's outside of, of our character, but in a metaphorical sense, this is like, you get rocked and you consult your subconscious. You sit there for a while and you think about it and you think about what your options would be and you consider all your regrets and, and possibilities in a kind of semi-meditative state where you're like, where am I actually at? And having formed that, you don't come out with ideas like, or conclusions, but you come, up, come out with the, the arrows. The arrows that are set are, are out there. You see the arrows, at least, and you can choose between your paths after the Hitogami conversation. So where do we end up after that? We talk to Sylvie about it. We're, we're relying on our, on our network. Our network is actually actively responding to what it notices in us. We don't have, even have to go to some parts of our network and say, hey, this thing happened and I'm really worried about it. Sylvie knows what's going on. We're sharing a life with this person. She looks at her partner husband and is like, He's rocked by this. He's really considering that he needs to go. I know that I'm pregnant, but what can I do to support my partner in this circumstance? And that's the first, like, spring back of that, that net that's been built. There's a lot that needs to be done directly to think it through, but Rudy doesn't collapse. Physically, his habits stay. And this is so interesting to me about the episode because this mirrors my experience 100%. There are times when I get rocked enough that my habits fall apart. Fair. Totally fair. But the degree of resilience that I feel having climbed out of my own internal pits and established habits, morning routines, routinized parts of my life that benefit me in simple, straightforward, subtle ways and keep continuity, those elements are a springboard, are a springboard. You hit... You hit rock bottom and you can rebound against the resilience of your physical body and, and nature. Like the things that you've trained and disciplined into yourself. So if you've got no exercise practice, no movement practice, let's call it. Because it doesn't even have to be exercise. It can be like yogic or stretching or something like that. A movement practice. Dance, tai chi, um, martial arts, running, uh, biking, whatever it is. A movement practice. And you do that every day or every other day or something like that. When shit goes wrong in your life, you have a thing to rely on, which is like, well, at least I'm still doing my bicycling. And that's powerful. It's powerful because it makes you feel like not everything in your life has fractured or fragmented. Rudy internally is freaking out 
right? He's mulling things over, over and over and over and over and over. But he's also physically stress relieving and maintaining his habits. He's maintaining his readiness to act and finds himself at the end of it ready to act. Capable of movement, capable of running, capable of pull-ups, capable of fighting, capable of thinking things through in his own space, inside his own head, with his partner, inside that very intimate private space, and with his found family, inside all these other relationships that he's forged and formed, all these other people who care about him and step in to some degree or another to offer advice, to offer help psychologically, physically, literally, the, the willingness to help and protect your family, to make sure that you feel like they're going to be safe, the willingness to come along with and be more bolster there, the willingness to tell you that you can go, to give you the options, and the willingness to do something crazy, as Norn does here, to force your hand. With his habits in place, with his self stronger, because that's what it is. That's what it is. People are a product of what they do. And how, what they do is often a product of how they feel. But how they feel is also often a product of what they do. It's cyclical. It's circular. If you do a bunch of good, productive things, you're going to feel more like a good, productive person. There are some layers there. Like, it might be difficult for you to see your own productivity. Um, it might be difficult for you to see your own progress. But you're a product of what you do. That's physical too. Your physical body and health is a product of your actions in a lot of ways. How you take care of it. So by doing and doing and doing, by doing friendship, by doing exercise, by doing progress, by doing recovery as well, having done that a couple times before, as Rudy is. Resilience is built. The ability to play in that space. A while ago, in season one of Mushoku Tensei, we talked about the pit. Because Rudius was in one, literally. And we've used that as a metaphor up through and to now. It's something I talked about there and in Cyberpunk Edge Runners. And some of you might conceptualize this as like a mental break for me. And it was to some extent. It was. It happens. It happens. People break down over time. People is like built up structures for understanding reality become worn out and need a change, need to be deconstructed and rebuilt. And in the wake of like overuse of certain, certain substances, certainly more disintegration of my structures occurred. And in the wake of some physical injuries and some real stressors in my life, some disintegration of my structures occurred and I've had to rebuild them. But as we went into that, as we began moving toward it, I talked to you all uh, a couple times about the pit and what I wanted to accomplish. What I wanted to accomplish and have to many degrees accomplished since then is the ability to be safe in the pit, to feel like there's a way out, to prove to myself and to you that I can get as dark as I can get and climb back out of it. When I started on that, spurred on by the ends of, end of Mushoku Tensei Season 1, and by Cyberpunk Edge Runners, and by a couple of other things, and by some real-world circumstances, I had done it the once, in a big, real way. I had fallen apart big time right before making the channel, and rebuilt myself as uh, structured toward this form of communication, this form of media understanding and analysis, and and using it as a valuable springboard to talk about the things that had helped me rebuild myself in the first place. It's sort of self-incorporating in that recursive way, because the thing that I'm doing is also the thing that's helping me do the thing that I'm expressing that I'm doing that is hopefully helping you do that thing too. Weird, but by climbing out of the pit, maybe I'm demonstrating one way that that can be done. By using these touchstones of media and the, these stories of other people who climb out of their own pits, hopefully we can share in that space and 
I can do more than just say to you, hey, I've been there, friend. Don't you worry, you can climb up out of it. But instead, do it as more of a show and tell and a demonstration and relation as we relate to these characters and understand their journeys. That second time falling into the pit, for me, the one that you all got to witness, if you did, if you were there for it, and can go back and it's, it's permanent, it's there in the videos, you can see me fall apart and fall together and come up with all sorts of new ideas, some of them having been filtered out as silly or absurd or not that useful over time, and some of them having been incorporated and now serving for me as current, present, important, crucial foundations for my understanding of reality because I've rebuilt a lot of my structures. This second time has been so, so much easier. It didn't feel much easier once I was in it. It felt pretty dark and scary and like there was no way out and all that stuff, but I knew that there was a way out. I was convinced of it. I was certain of it. And I had been through those, those handholds before. I had charted a bit of a path. It's like uh, the, the Batman sequence where he's climbing out of the thing. You know, he knows the path. It's just about making the leap. I feel like I had a lot of my own so safety nets when I fell in a way that I didn't before. Because when I fell years and years ago, before I started the channel, it was straight to rock bottom. There was nothing to catch me, internally or externally, certainly externally. Nobody, nothing, nothing to rely on. I had to build it. And a lot of it's you. A lot of it's you. It's the viewers. It's the patrons. It's the people in the Discord. It's the the consistency of support it's the um the love and kindness and having this community um a lot of those are my trampoline but it's also personal things being in a safer place to live um being around people that i can rely on for some degree of support uh, even if it's not perfect it's certainly something having the ability to get outside of my space to have uh, uh vehicles for travel my electric unicycle be able to go around town and see things and do stuff and not feel trapped. All sorts of things. All sorts of things. And internal things as well. Pieces of all the stories that we've gathered that have been extremely helpful for me. So it's very cool for me to see Rudius get whomped in a turning point. A very scary thing. Very traumatic. Very terrifying. And he does get whomped by it. Let's not Let's not ignore this feeling, this darkness. This is enough to upset his entire train of being. This is enough to totally cascade out of control, to catapult Rudius into despair, to send him into this nervous, fucking heavy breathing energy, talking about being stuck between a rock and a hard place. I, I'm going to regret both of them. This stupid god won't tell me what's really going on and being frustrated and furious. It's enough. This could have rocked Rudy. This could have torn it all apart. But he wakes up to the loving, the loving gaze of his wife who genuinely cares and wants to solve this with him. He goes out and he has practices and patterns established that he can fall back on and at least be and continue being and not get stuck. He has friends and found family who are more than willing to help him in every way that they can to give him advice and to bolster him, to make sure that he understands what his options are. And as we look up and out at all these windows and all the people we might be leaving behind here in the house, it's Norn who shows us one of the more crucial things. When you have something that you can do, and you feel like nobody else can, you don't want whatever's going to happen to happen if you don't go and do it. You kind of have to. If you have the opportunity to do something really important and you choose not to, that's the surest fire, surest way to end up with big, big, big regrets. And so, with a powerful declaration that's not a specific one. It's maybe a broad oath. 
maybe a broad oath, maybe one that you might regret saying all of, but with a big declaration, Rudius says, I am going to save our family, all of it. The point has turned, and our direction is out. It's through one of the windows, through one of the doors. We're back on the road. Now we have a place to come back to and something to go achieve. People to save out there and people to return to at home. Rudy finds himself now tangled in a web of responsibilities. The ones he's taken upon himself. The ones that make him well, they stretch him out and they cause him pain, but they make him bigger and stronger. They make his influence grow, his capacity to change this world, especially for the people he cares about, grow. And Rudius continues, as is our original title, to really try this time. To really try. To take on those responsibilities. To embrace what he can do, instead of turning away from it and saying, I can't do anything about this. This is outside of my control. I'm too small. Rudia steps forward, turns toward, stands up, and carries that family along with him. It's a powerful growth that we've just seen in our character. What a different man he is growing into being. What a beautiful thing to witness. What a cool episode of Mushoku Tensei. Scary, scary. But it turns out, when you're resilient like this, there's a lot less to be afraid of. And even the scariest things, if you're stable, you can set and push back. I love that. Next week, we'll start pushing. See you there. Thanks for joining me for this spooky episode. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Much love. Early access on the Patreon. Peace. Peace.